our guest speaker uh, in the first hour, um, I want to just simply say that remember how we started out in our class in relation to uh, the empowerment themes and the challenges for uh, social workers in promoting empowerment. Um, and in, in a way, we're kind of making a, a great circle connection, really going back to that theme as we move toward the conclusion of our class. And I think we're really fortunate uh, today to have uh, Greg Beckley of the Western Montana Empowerment Project uh, join us. And uh, oh, I'm really curious about the Empowerment Project. How did that come to be? What's it about? Who is this guy? What's, what are the aims of this kind of an organization? And so on. We'll have a chance to ask questions and so forth, and Greg will give us some clues about that. And I also want to say that uh, uh, Gwen, uh, Gwen, help me. Hop, Hoppy. Hoppy, yeah, it's, it's the Latin Germanic? Yeah, okay. Gwen Hoppy, uh, our camera person, uh, will be doing some recording. And that means, uh, in a sense, that is for a given purpose, and uh, so we need to ask you some questions about that. So I'm going to turn things over to Greg at this point in time, and he'll take it from here. Yes, my name is Greg Beckley. I'm the founder and director of the Western Montana Empowerment Project. One of the things we're doing today is taping for MCAT, so if there's anybody who does, definitely does not want to be on MCAT, let me know and we won't videotape you. Well, we, but if somebody has a question or something, we may videotape or we may come here. I just want people to know that we are taping this for MCAT. The reason we're taping it for MCAT is I'm doing this for the Department of Social Work, but if we get it out to MCAT, we, we can do it as part of an outreach program and to help get more members. So that's why we're videotaping it, and that's really the only place it will go. Um, I'm going to talk about basically about three things. The formation of the Empowerment Project, what the Empowerment Project is doing now, and what we will do in the future. I have bipolar disorder, and in 1991 I had a severe psychotic break, and I'll, I'll, I will read you a poem about that in a little while. Before that time, I, I was experiencing what is called a manic high, in which everything was beautiful and great. I was extraordinarily creative. For example, I did some video work about an area called Blackleaf Canyon that's near Shoto. It's threatened by oil and gas development, and I did a video project about that which got into the art museum for two months. I was writing and so forth. I had no idea that I was really in considerable amount of danger. Also, I'd like to read you this. Um, it, during the Gulf War, I held a vigil at the War Memorial near the courthouse. I was there for five days. And this gives you a, my take on what, what is the nature of mental illness, and I would like to read it to you. It's pretty short. At the beginning of the Gulf War, I held a vigil at the War Memorial at the Missoula County Courthouse. I was there for five days. It was January, I think, and it was cold. I was completely opposed to the war and wanted to do something. I brought toothpaste, an excellent abrasive, and a toothbrace to the war memorial. I polished the names of the fallen soldiers until they shone one by one. While doing this, I chanted the mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum. It took a long time to clean each name. After cleaning the name, I visualized a lotus coming out of my heart and entering the heart of the dead man. I hoped that this act of remembering the true nature of war death would help to prevent war. I also tended to an altar whose main image was Tara. This altar had been cr created by numerous people who lit candles, hung out, and so on. A sense of community was created. After five days, I was getting sick. I felt a lot like pneumonia, so I called it quits. I went to a friend's house. He was gone. I drew a mandala on the wall with crayon and arranged an altar. I couldn't find a Buddha image, but I found a picture of Thich Nhat Hanh. I arranged the altar and bowed to the picture. A small dove, one half inch long and made of light, flew out of the picture and entered my heart, then it flew back into the picture. It felt great. Tw years before, about 20 of us attended a retreat with Thich Nhat Hanh at the Providence Zen Center in Rhode Island. Two days into the retreat, we received word that a hurricane was coming. Thich Nhat Hanh said that if a storm is coming, 
one person can remain calm. That will also help others. The approaching storm did not appreciably affect the meditative calm that this retreat embodied. At the last moment, it veered off. When I look back at the vigil at the courthouse, I can say that what I did had undeniable religious and political aspects and was fully acceptable within a Mahayana Buddhist framework. Another framework that is worthy of consideration in my case is the psychiatric. I have bipolar disorder. I've had it since 1982. I would experience a sharp psychotic break six months after seeing the vision of the dove. With the dove, I feel as though I reached out to the universe and the universe responded. My bipolar illness was a factor, but the phenomenon cannot be reduced to that. Here's the question I want to ask the class. What is insane? Invading Kuwait? Bombing Baghdad? Having a vision of a dove? Or watching the war on television? So when people like myself who have a diagnosable religious, not a religious, excuse me, uh, mental disorder, are often persecuted in this society. We receive bad treatment. The, the police can be extremely brutal to us and so forth. But, but there's other things that are pathological about the culture that are accepted. And I'm, I'm still trying, trying to come to terms with that, you know? Um, us too. All of us here, I guess, yeah. So uh, in 1991, I had a severe psychotic break. What had happened was there was a, a woman named Anna and I were planning to go to Blackleaf Canyon to, to, to do some camping. And I went looking for her in the farmer's market and totally lost my mind there. And I would like to read you this poem. This poem is important to me because a psychotic break of the magnitude that I experienced is extremely unsettling and actually very terrifying. And one of the results of a psychotic break is that you tend to lose trust in your own emotions and mind. This is a theme that will come up a little later, too. But the idea is, by writing the experience into a poem, I helped myself gain control over those emotions. That, make, that makes logical sense, doesn't it? And I'd like to read you this poem. This will give you a sense. Let me make sure everything's in order first. This will give you a sense of what psychosis is like, particularly bipolar psychosis. Once I went crazy and walked out of town. Before walking out of town, I went looking for Anna, who I had a crush on. I went to the farmer's market in Missoula, Montana. Lots of people go there. Maybe I could find her. When I got there, I knew the war was starting. I was certain that the Hmong vegetable vendors had guns and were going to attack another vegetable vendor because he had once enslaved them. I walked south, out of town, lost, confused, and sure of my purpose but I couldn't remember what my purpose was. I walked anyway, I walked all night, 28 miles, past bars, past stores, past churches, not past all churches. I tried some doors looking for a place to spend the night. All doors were locked. I kept walking. I believed I could stop cars with my thoughts. Alien spacecraft appeared in the sky. Lolo Steakhouse was a bed of heroin dealers. Walking, walking, dawn was coming. I slept in a barn on a ranch bun run by a friend. I woke up and walked to Stevensville. Smoke coming out of the forest was funeral pyres for the war dead. Our guerrilla forces controlled the UPS and postal service, or so the park trucks told me. I went to the Lonesome Dove Saloon and drank a strawberry daiquiri. Signs of the war were everywhere. The fitness center was really a torture chamber. The waste treatment plant was full of chopped up bodies. I went to the small historic church to sit, to relax, it was locked. I went to the church next door, it was locked. I wanted to go into the teepee, and he was set up by the small church, but it was a blue star teepee, and I was from the red star. They were our mortal enemies. I walked through town, I saw the blue neon sign for the Stephen, newspaper, the Stevensville Star. 
The bad star, I thought, I picked up a rock and threw it at the sign. The sign smashed apart. I kept walking until I walked out of town. Minutes later, a Ravalli County Sheriff's car pulled up behind me. I was handcuffed and made to kneel. This is it, I thought. I'm dead, as I saw the contrails of five intercontinental ballistic missiles arching across the sky. I heard a click and thought it was the hammer being drawn back on a revolver. Anna, I cried with all my strength, certain that death was near. Then I thought, anything is possible. I was placed in the patrol car and driven south to Hamilton. I heard the driver say, we have captured the cosmic commander and he's down to 5% of his energy. Then I arrived in jail. In the elevator that brought me underground, I saw the mark of the demon on the cop's face. And I knew I was going to hell. I was placed in a cell in solitary. And I knew I would never get out. This was eternity. This was hell. I tore the phone off the wall because it was blue, the color of the enemy star. Dazed in weeks past, I had beautiful and horrific visions. Here are some of the visions. I am living with Clarita Ruiz in the Colombian jungle. We are married and our baby daughty Cheeky likes bananas. Suddenly the army appears. They open fire. I escape. Clarita and the baby are killed. I am living with Luzma off the Pacific coast of Colombia. We have a baby daughter. We play by the ocean edge. The army comes and shoots us. Luzma and the baby die and I am wounded in the leg. After I heal, I carry the baby's corpse to the high mountains of northern Colombia to the land of the Kogi. Torrential rains occur in southern Colombia. It is a signal to begin the revolution. I am traveling in interstellar space. Galaxies hang in space. Time slows down. I am all Buddhas through space and time. Amitabha, Amitayas, Maitreya. Everything is still, calm, quiet. I am by the shore of Grey Wolf Lake in the Mission Mountains of Montana. I am caught in a bear trap by both feet. A short distance away and barely out of reach, Anna is caught in a bear trap too. People who have been our friends surround us with knives. They have turned totally evil. I rip out of my bear trap, leaving my feet behind. Anna rips out of hers. I carry her on my back until we reach a swiftly flowing stream. We fall in and die of blood loss. <coughs> Anna visits. The sick, thick glass I see her. She seems dying and she seems sick and in my cell I think she is dying. I think of her and call out to her constantly because I, I feel I can help her if only I could be with her. Shortly afterward I had a vision of two objects, a bracelet and a jeweled cross. The bracelet is pure silver with three cut stones. The central stone is a diamond. The diamond is flanked by two rubies. The cross is an equilateral cross with green emblem maybe jade or emerald. The bracelet was my fundamental essence, the cross, the essence of my wife. The bra bracelet has three gems, and the triple gem, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, is what Buddhism is often called. The diamonds may be ice, signifying high mountains, clear water, while the rubies signified fire. The cross is balanced the four directions. It is Christian, but it is the cross of the living Christ, not the crucified one. The green and gold are commerce, the ripening of gold and wheat, and the greening of all vegetation. But mostly I thought about the war. I was a political prisoner sentenced by a clandestine court. After two months of crazy isolation, I was transferred to the state hospital in Warm Springs. I would be there another two months before given medication for my mental illness. It was the wrong medication, and I would go crazy again. But that is another story. That, I hope that gives you a sense of what a psychotic break is like. They're not very much fun, but there are elements of great beauty in, uh, in them at times, too. So, so, so I decided not to discard that psychotic event from my experience. I decided to embrace it and write the poem about it. Then, then what happened was I, I applied for SSI, which is social security, and people with mental illness can get SSI so that they can live, so that they don't have to work. I applied for it after this psychotic break and didn't get it. And I would have subsequent psychotic breaks, so eventually I got it. And what I did is I, I went to Nepal. Like I finally got back pay and I said, well, I'm gonna go hiking in Nepal, I've been through all this shit, so I'm gonna go to Nepal and do some hiking in the Himalayas, and I felt confident enough in myself to do it. 
I got $7,200 in back pay. So I, I had a pretty good time for a while. But I had some money left in my account after six months, and I didn't know you're supposed to take it out. So SSI took my money. You know, and I felt, that at that point, I actually felt, uh, I, I felt extremely suicidal. And, and I think a lot of what happens to people with mental illness can be related to this. We're, we're, we are isolated individuals subjected to top-down systems. And I was, I was an isolated individual, individual subjected to a top-down system with no way to respond, really, you know? There tends to be a somewhat totalitarian nature to the mental health care system and frequently you're treated like a child. You know, like controlling somebody's money is a big deal, don't you think? I mean, uh, so anyway, I, 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 I felt like I didn't want to live anymore. I, gave, I sort of gave up. But there was a part of me that really wanted to live, so it was a really big struggle in me. And what kept me going was that I was going to perform, read this poem with banjo accompaniment on KUFM radio. And then we'd give an announcement about mental health issues and, and, and if people need services, who to get in touch with at the end of the poem. So that's what kept me going. And it was that poem, writing that poem, and making what was per first private and personally painful public that really was the beginning of the empowerment project. And that, I'm, a, I'm a Buddhist and I study tantric Buddhism. And uh, I began, because I was so on edge, I, be, I had brought back a, uh, a mala or like a rosary from Nepal. It was a really old Tibetan one. And I used that and I did this mantra, um, Om Tare to Tare Tare Soha, which is for, for a goddess named Tara. And, and, I, and I, to stabilize my mind and so I wasn't completely flipping out, I began doing that. And then I went to Florida. My sister lives in Florida and I, I, I tend to visit her every year. I kept doing the, uh, the mantra and I had this dream that I was walking down a path with some Tibetan monks and there were sutras or holy texts on the ground and I bent over and picked one up and I woke up and I said, what does that dream mean? Well, it obviously it means pick up some Tibetan texts. So I got an 800 number and got some catalogs and you know, began to study philosophy again. What it really meant deeper was you can trust your own mind now. Because I was scared of my mind. I, I'm fairly bright. I've gotten scholarships all throughout university, and I have a master's degree from Smith College in education and so forth. And uh, uh, I did it all on scholarship. And I was, but I was afraid of my mind because my mind, when, I, when I'm psychotic, my mind gets me in trouble, you know. So uh, then I, I, I wasn't quite sure what to do with it yet, you know. And then I went to Massachusetts. My sister told me about a place called Western Massachusetts Empowerment Center, which is a center for people with mental illness. They have a variety of resources available that's completely run by people with mental illness. They have nonprofit status. They, they, they didn't prove, I went to visit them a little while ago, and they didn't prove to be that useful of a model for me because they get state funding. They get $96,000 a year from the state. And uh, I can't hope to do that, you know. But anyway, the idea was, let's create an empowerment project in Montana. Take that idea and, uh, and begin, begin working on it. Build up a base of people with mental illness who, who will offer each other mutual support, get nonprofit status so we can get grants, and, uh, and so on. So I came, I, what I did is I wrote a proposal about the Empowerment Project while I was in Massachusetts about how I wanted to start one. I gave one to Jean Durant, who's the coordinator of uh, adult mental health services in Missoula County, and I gave one to an organization called Cold Mountain Cold Rivers, which I had been instrumental in forming in about 1989 or, eight, nine, or 90, something like that. And, uh, because I wanted them to serve as our fiscal agent, because we, we didn't have you know, nonprofit status. They do. So what's the first thing we did? The first thing I did was work with Gwen, who's videotaping it now, on uh, a video called With Our Own Voices. The title is significant. 
When you're in the mental hospital, your own voice really doesn't matter. You're there to be processed and sort of spit out into society again. But things like, you know, creativity or uh, insight into reality or whatever, forget it. You know, they don't care about that. Uh, so the idea was for, to allow people to uh, talk about their experience in front of the camera. And I felt this might be good for people do that because it would help them again get something personal. I was drawing from my own experience of the poem really. Make something that was personal public and that way you deal with some of the painful aspects of it. So we completed that video very successfully. We had six people. We originally had eight but what we did because mental health population is a sensitive population to work with, we decided to show people video clips of how they came out on television before doing the final edit. And if you're, doing, if you're, if you're going to work with me, people with mental illness on the video, I suggest you do the same. In that, uh, that way people can say, no, I really don't like the way I presented myself, and uh, I declined to have it in, in the final form. So while we interviewed eight, we only had six. But it was a half hour long. Jeanette Rankin Peace Resource Center heard about it, and we had it as one of their peace potlucks. They have these uh, monthly peace potlucks where they have uh, different videos and you go and you eat food and watch a video. And so that got, it got out to the wider community and I felt very satisfied with that. While we were working at that, we had a video and it was, there used to be a place called Bojangles that's since gone out of business, but we, uh, we, we did a benefit there. Several, I, several I, I, members had started to accrue. We had four members now and uh, we, we had a benefit. And again, a benefit's important, you know, to be out front like this about your mental illness is, is, is uh, to take a sort of a, a, a step in that you might fear rejection or something because you have a mental illness. But anyway, we, we did that um, benefit. And I, I read my poetry, Rich performed his songs, and uh, we got 80 bucks, which was a lot for us right there. Because I live on, you know, as I say, I live on SSI and I only get 434 a month. So to, to, to even buy a grant guide, a grant, typical grant guide costs about $25. So even to buy a grant guide was expensive. But that's what we did. We'd use that money to get grant guides and we wrote a proposal to the Ben and Jerry's Foundation. They, they give grants for under $1,000 for merely one page proposals. So if you're just starting out, it's an excellent place to. And what we needed was money for office to get like a printer. We had a computer, but we needed a printer. We needed money for uh, internet. We needed money for envelopes, postage. All that stuff really adds up fast, as I'm sure you're aware. Mm -hmm. But um, and we and we and we used some of it for projects. So we we had some money to work to work with now. Kept getting members and. Uh, then, let's see, what was the next project? Let me think for a minute. Well, just getting the thing going was a project. We, we put out a newsletter. That's an important little project to let people know what we're doing. This year, we've done two significant projects, I think. Uh, but anyway, I just want to talk about this a little bit. If, you, if you're confronted by this top-down system, you can't move up as an individual to confront it. But if you can link up laterally, like that, then you can actually get some bottom-up. It gives you more power. It's actually a political move to gain more power. But also to have the emotional solidarity with people who have mental illness and so forth is very, very important. So you can discuss what happened to you, and then you realize, oh, it happened to me too, and so forth. You know, it's really good. Uh, this, this year, we did two projects. One of them. I'm particularly proud of. I know a man named Father Jose Alas. He's also known as Chencho. He's a Salvadoran priest who introduced liberation theology. I don't know much about liberation theology, but it's a type of, to El Salvador. It's a type of Christianity which, which says, you know, really live your life in accordance to Christ. You know, that means to not only take care of your life, but to resist oppression. So he, he co-founded 30 communities that began living this way. And then he, then he started a group called FAPU, and I'm particularly interested in FAPU, in that what they, FAPU is the United Popular Action Front. There are all these grassroots organizations in El Salvador, sort of like this, isolated. FAPU linked them all up, and they began 
to uh, demand change from the government, particularly land reform. And uh, when, when we, had, we, we had a thing called the Gathering of the Grassroots where we invited grassroots organizations from around the, the area to come listen to him talk about FAPU and hopefully connect up. In other words, the, the talk and the action were, 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 were the united were united practice and theory. We were doing what he was talking about while he was talking. And, uh, and that's important from the point of view of mental illness, because uh, one of the things that people with mental illness feel in the society is an intense marginalization. Partly it's due to class differences, just that the fact we're so poor, we can't participate in a lot of things. But also, there's there's still a, 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 a pretty big stigma against about mental illness in the society, and we face discrimination in jobs and so forth. So I figure if if, if the uh, empowerment project coordinated this gathering, which we did, that would end some of our marginalization. We'd meet more people, connect up with more groups and so forth, and become an active player in the in the, in the local sort of grassroots political scene. Well, it worked. It worked in that eight groups showed up. We they gave presentations. He talked about FAPU. Then he talked about another organization called ITAMA, which is the Institute for Technology, the Environment, and Self Sufficiency. This would influence our thinking, and I'll get back to that a little later on. I'm not going to talk much longer, but there's two more things I want to cover. The other project we did was uh, doesn't sound like a, necessarily a project that people with mental illness would do. But it, it relates back to my earlier essay, The Dove, in that near Shoto, and north of the Pine View Reserve, Shoto's in the eastern part of the state, there's a canyon called Blackleaf Canyon. This is the place where the most grizzly bears come out onto the Great Plains. There's no other place like it. And the Nature Conservancy has spent millions of dollars uh, buying and, and preserving the adjacent landscape. Well, they want to drill for oil and gas there, of course, you know. So I got, a, I got a grant from the Fund for Wild Nature. That's a good one. If you want to do something on nature, keep them in mind. They're in Corvallis, Oregon. Because you don't need 501c3 to get your grant. You can just get it and go with it. You have to submit a final report with receipts, though. But anyway, of, of the people that we did a photography project and, and, and also a video. The idea was we'd go and document Blackleaf Canyon. But, but I, I wrote a poem that I'd like to share with you that goes like this. They said I was crazy and I was crazy. Because I was crazy, I was locked in cell and solitary for two and a half months. I was dangerous, crazy. I saw many things. I saw universes come and go. I saw fierce battles at gold mines. I saw people die. A clear cut is crazy. Nuclear arms are crazy. A cyanide heat bleach mine is crazy. And I say, where are the institutions now that we really need them? You know, it's kind of a bitter poem. But uh, the idea that we have to relate our mental illness to larger cultural illnesses. And uh, so and what we did is we had a, uh, a show of the photographs of Butterfly with a little written thing that said that this was co coordinated by the Western Montana Empowerment Project, an organization by and for people with mental illness. And we did receive a phone call for a woman who seemed to be in obvious need of psychological services, and we did refer her to the appropriate agency. So even though one, only one person responded, one person is very important, I think. I think that, so we did get a response. And, and what's happened, what, well, this is kind of neat, what's happened uh, with the, uh, with the gathering in the grassroots is we invited Garden City Harvest to come and we talked to them. There's a place called River House, which is over by Food Farm, which has day, sort of like a day treatment place for people with mental illness and people can hang out there. And one very important thing they have there is, is, a, is a free lunch for people with mental illness. When you consider the average studio apartment costs 350 and people are making 484, it's not surprising that they're, they're having a hard time eating. But, but I talked to Garden City Harvest about getting some of their produce, which they give to Pavarello and the food bank, to, to Riverhouse. And they're going to check that out. 
So there's a positive outcome from that one too. I mean, and what that is, it's bottom up change. It's, it's, it's um, grassroots actually affecting the institution, the, the institutionalized uh, mental health system. And what we're, good, what we're working on now, and this will be really all I'm going to say, is uh, we are going to build, a friend of mine is, is turning his uh, garage into a commercial kitchen. We, working with Garden City Harvest, we found out that in two days they had uh, gleaned a ton of apples from neighborhoods around Missoula. Um, the, the, these apples were just going to waste. People would just give, give them away to you to get them out of your yard. So what we're going to do is build a hydraulic cider press. And uh, the Empowerment Project will sell this cider at the farmer's market. This, this, this lessens our dependence on external funding. It, it, it's also the idea of, of Chekchos, self-sufficiency. And you want to create these projects, you become more economically self-sufficient. Also, for people to work together, you know, we've got plenty of times in our hands because we're on SSI. Why not work together to, to create something that will actually bring revenue into the empowerment project that, that then can be used for empowerment project projects, which could include the very people who are working. It's a way, partly it's a way around SSI in that it can gain, gain people money, not in the sense of money in their pocket, but in the sense of resources at their disposal. But it doesn't influence your SSI payments. It's sort of like a legal money laundering scheme, you know? <laughs> well, that's about all I have to say. If anybody's interested in uh, the Empowerment Project and would like to stay in touch, please let me know. And I can, I can um, write your name down. Are there any questions? We don't, oh, one thing, we don't have our 501c3 status yet, federal, so we're working on that. Right now we're using sponsoring organizations. Yeah. Um, going way back in the beginning stages of the Congress, Yes. Uh, you mentioned that when you got cut off, or not cut off, but when SSI took back right. the money, are you saying that's what kicked in the beginning stages of the Congress, and that's what got you rolling? Well, it caused, it caused me such, in, in a way, I think it did, in that uh, I felt as though I was being treated like a child, that I was getting the shit end of the stick, you know? Because I, I just really, it just really bummed me out. It wasn't that I was greedy for the money or anything, don't get me wrong, but uh, I felt as though I was being treated like a child. And, and, and I decided to, and I, and I hated it, it really bothered me. But at, at, fortunately, I was doing that poem. So I think, I think the thing that really started the Empowerment Project for me was the writing of that poem. That, that's the thing that really did it. You know, because you're full of self-doubt after you go through a psychotic break. You know, it's like, am I falling in love or I'm just having a manic break? You know, I don't know, you know. <laughs> Both feel pretty good. I can't tell, you know. So by writing that poem, that's what, that, that poem has really been the mainstay of, for me, of, of the organization. Yes? How long after the, your break did you write that poem? A couple of years. And you can, you can remember it so clearly. Yeah, there's a lot more. Just, there was a lot more, but you know, it, it, when I, I should just comment on that. That was a very severe uh, violation of my human rights in that I was charged with criminal mischief because I had broken something over $300, and that's a felony. Since that time, they've changed the law to up to $500 just to prevent cases like mine from happening. But I was treated as a felon, was locked in solitary for a month or two in a Valley County jail with a completely blown mind with no consultation or anything. That was my other question. Why did they do that for so long without giving you help right away? And I went to Warm Springs and the same thing, no help. They just locked me up in a cell for observation. Now obviously, if it happened to you, you might be paranoid too, you know? And I got diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic because my condition is, had deteriorated so much over the course of the uh, being in solitary. That deteriorates anybody. It's, you know, it's, it felt extremely punitive, and it was because we're still we still tend to treat people with mental illness as weird criminals or something like that. You know. Yes. Do you encourage uh, people who do not live with mental illness to join your project? Well, the, the criterion for the project 
you know, for it to be a member of the project is you have a mental illness or you've had a history of mental illness. Like say if you've been institutionalized when you were 12 or something, mm -hmm. but don't have it active anymore, that still counts. And uh, But we encourage people to get our newsletter and stuff like that, and we encourage people to stay in touch. And because uh, the more community support we get, the better off we are. So we want to make this a real community thing. We're social workers, and so in some ways, uh, we may be educating ourselves uh, to be uh, a part of the establishment, but we don't want to be a part of an establishment that functions in the way in which you were describing right. that diagram. Uh, what kinds of things do you want to tell us that uh -huh. might be helpful to us? Well, first of all, I think it's important to realize that mental illness is not completely bad. That bipolar disorder has had, had for me a religious and mystical uh, aspect to it. Uh, and in that, when I had that, I am a Buddhist, and when I found, when I saw that vision of the bracelet with the three jewels, and that boy said, that's your fundamental essence, well, uh, that made me sense that really is who I am, you know? And that image stays with me and is useful in my daily life. Psychosis is not completely bad and not, and that's I think what's important to understand, that, that, it, that it's important to respect the fact that a person is thinking in quite a different manner than you and that who are you to say that you're completely right? Because none of us are. So I think that that's important, just a, just a, res, a sort of a respect for that space. And, and, and uh, also, I, I think that there are, uh, when, and I can speak from personal experience, coming out of the mental hospital and being sort of dumped back on the streets again, a person is likely to go back into the mental hospital because they don't have a stable situation in which they can act, remember to take their medication, and they don't have money. The most important thing for, for somebody who's just come out of a hospital is resources, particularly money so they can buy meds and food. I, I didn't have enough money while, you know, during these years to live in a house, but what I did is I bought a van. At least I was off the street and living in a van. And uh, so creative things like that to try to get some type of housing for people and some types of medication and food are, are extremely important. And I think in many ways if social workers stick to the basics and do them well, they have to sort of learn to let go, almost like parents to children of their clients to a certain extent. You know, you, can, you might want to get a little overly involved in their life. You don't really want to do that. You want the people to grow on their own. So there, there can be, it's like a student-teacher relationship or something like that, but, uh, you know, um, I just think it's important to, yeah, allow people to develop. Does the empowerment project, in some ways, do you think, uh, threaten the uh, mental health establishment? No, I don't think so. I don't think it threatens it at all. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't see us as a threat. We don't have an antagonistic relationship with the mental health system here at all. And even though I describe the mental health system as a fundamentally top-down model, which it is, I don't feel. I feel as though I can work with it. There are some excellent people in the mental health care system here in Missoula. I think it's it, it's much better than Hamilton. And uh, I don't know, some people say it's the best in the state. I don't know if it's true. But I, I, we, we don't have an adversarial relationship with them. And uh, we, like for example, trying to get more food to River House. We're working with River House, but we're coming up with it on our own to try to help the whole situation. That's the kind of bottom-up change that I like to see. Any other questions? Comments? <coughs> yes. Um, you say you started, this started to happen in 1982. What was... Well, I, 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 it, my first psychotic break was in 1982, but it went away, so I really didn't get going on it until 90 or 91. Okay, so how did that like, come about? How did you... What, was there one thing that just you could notice that just pushed you or no, no no what I noticed there were there were small signs for a while for example when I did the vigil at the courthouse and seeing a vision of a dove 
I thought it was pretty neat. At the same time, that was sort of a warning sign that maybe a psychosis was coming, a warning sign that I ignored. And I would just see little things, you know, I, I would think little strange thoughts, but I, people with manic depression or bipolar disorder can't tell that they're going crazy because you believe the thought systems you're believing. So, so uh, and I can't point to any particular incident. It's more like a biological clock ticking its way out. I think it might have had something to do with the stress by the fact that I was homeless and out of money and stuff, and, or just about out of money. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life, which, would, which were also symptoms of bipolar disorder. But uh, just that stress, I think, is a major factor. How do you feel about uh, meds and like what meds were you on? And okay, well, right now, I'm, uh, I, I, I think that meds can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. I do believe in them. You know, what I've got, it's not a question of like something that needs to be solved with therapy or something like that. It's not like issues of it's not like, you know, my mother was mean to me or something like that that I've got to work out with a therapist. What I have is a physiological condition. Bipolar disorder is a physiological condition where you get too much neurological firing and you get pretty confused. Um, the experience of bipolar disorder is very similar to a mushroom trip. It probably triggers some of the same Probably, it's probably a similar process. But, uh, so I believe firmly in people taking meds. I really do believe in them. Well, I guess that's it. Any other comments or? I, I had one question. Uh, I noticed that when Riverhouse first began and described itself as a psychosocial rehabilitation Program similar to Fountain House mm -hmm. in New York, that um, basically they were taking kind of the position in their organization that this was a place where people with mental illness uh, could come and to participate in the kind of everyday um, activities of living. Mm -hmm. And then there would be different kinds of work groups where people would learn, for example, if you were related to the one uh, in terms of the kitchen, that you would think about like a, a menu and you'd plan it out, you'd go shopping, mm -hmm. you'd prepare a meal, you would serve, and, mm -hmm. and so on. And everybody had a thing like that that they were adding into the mm -hmm. total organization. And the belief was that um, that was therapeutic in and of itself mm -hmm. because one of the hassles of life, uh, particularly uh, if uh, your life has deteriorated in some ways, to find some structure, develop mm -hmm. some skills, and be able to do some things that other people can recognize mm -hmm. and appreciate, and so on. And it seems as though uh, River House, you know, has evolved over a period of time and has more of a uh, kind of a, a psychiatric flavor to it. Yeah, now. I think it does. I don't. I don't really like it there myself. I don't go there. Because it feels like it's sort of institutional. Mm. It has an institutional feel to it, and uh, there's not a lot to do there. So it's really, uh, I think it serves some people in the population, but for a lot of people, it's just like a place that they would not want to go. Mm -hmm. How many residents are there at any given time? Well, I would say about. Uh, 30 to 40? 30? Probably 30. Oh, yeah, both sexes. I think so, yeah, both sexes. Uh -huh. I'm sure you could go for a visit sometime, yeah. you know? But uh, I think, what I found about it, I, I, don't, I didn't like being institutionalized. And uh, River House has a sort of this institutional feel, and they're trying to do too much out of it, maybe. They, this is where you meet for your meds. This is where I go to my med clinic with my psychiatrist, and right. they have offices there and so forth for, Gene Durant's office is there, for example, you know? So it's almost as though they're trying to do too much out of it, probably because of budget constraints. Yeah. But, um... It doesn't feel like a place to live. No, it doesn't feel welcoming. Yeah. How would you change that? I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I haven't... I think to, to, to actually... Create, uh, first of all, I don't know if the idea of, of, a, of, a, of a centralized 
place where people do things is necessarily what I would do if I were directing something like that. I think what I would do, for example, if Garden City Harvest needed help gathering vegetables, get the people out into the community and interact with more people in the community gathering vegetables. When you get a lot of people with mental illness together, they don't have the opportunity to really outreach to, to the community and do things in the community. One thing that we've been very good about in the Empowerment Project is, uh, is working with other community members that do not have mental illness. This avoids the alienation that you can sometimes feel, and certainly the marginalization. So I would do something along those lines for River House. And I'm sorry I can't be more specific, but... Uh, what you're saying is very powerful ideas, though, uh -huh. I think, because this tendency for organizations to think in many ways is a very centralizing kind of thinking. I mean, I'm working on a project related to web pages uh, at the university here, and uh, we have a committee of folks that's very organized and doing a uh -huh. terrific job, but it is a, a little group working with the big university rather than how, how can we kind of get lots of people doing their thing. Right. And it's a different thing. It's a different yeah. way of thinking. And, and uh -huh. it's a challenge to overcome it. Yeah. Yes. Where's your present office? Oh, it's, four, it's 436 Ford Street. It's out of my apartment, basically, but 436 Ford Street, number 103. And I'll give you a phone number, too. You know where Ford is? Yes. And it's 542 1599. Isn't that just kind of behind Grizzly Grocery? Yeah, it's right behind Grizzly Grocery. You know that big apartment building there? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm done. I hope I did a good job. I, I haven't given a presentation like this ever. And uh, I, just, I just wanted to sort of share with you the, some of the ideas that we're coming up with. I think that they're sensible and reasonable. We are getting funding for them. That's encouraging. And uh, I, I hope I didn't put too much of the personal in. But one thing that's very important is uh, mental health issues, like any other issues, can also become alienating. And one of the members of the Empowerment Project just totally burned and crashed after working, I think, at the Meriwether Lewis Institute or something like that. Just lost it because he, it was, the, the work there was actually alienating you from him. And I, I don't want that to happen to me or, or the members of our organization. And we try to have fun, too. Like going up to Blackwood Canyon was fun, you know? Boy, you have given us actually so much information, so many ideas. and. So many tie-ins, right, with the class uh, that it is incredibly valuable. Uh, I'm really glad you came, Greg. Well, I'm really glad you invited me, I, and, I, I, and I, I also would like to encourage people in the class to to con really consider get, getting getting involved in the mental health field. I think it can be very rewarding. Someone like myself, who is basically a basket case, has evolved into me giving my presentation like this. And for a case manager to see that could be very rewarding because they're they're helping you along, you know. And uh, and just to help people get some housing or uh, tell them about the free meal or whatever could mean a great deal of difference in somebody's life. So I would I would actually encourage people to uh, get into the field. I, I'm considering actually going back to school and doing it myself. So I'm done. Mm -hmm. Thank Good. you very much. Thank you, Greg. I hope maybe in the past, in the future as well, you'll you'll consider uh, coming back and uh, joining us. Well, you have my number, don't you? I sure do. Okay, well, just don't hesitate to give me a call. And anybody here who wants more information, call me up. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Does this class go longer than? Yes, it does. Actually, it goes for two hours. So we're going to take a break now, and uh, then we'll uh, move ahead this next hour. This will be on MCAT about a month from now. Yeah. If anyone has any questions.